Hi, so I move around a lot, so I'm just going to hold this. Um, hi, I'm Tibbs. Um, we're going to be talking about um, forensics, well, digital forensics and how Python is incorporated into that. Um, if I can get my clicker to work. Um, just so that we all are on the same page. Um, in this talk, we're going to define what digital forensics is. We're going to look at the uses for digital forensics. Um, going to look at what kind of tasks um, are carried out as part of that process. And um, through doing that, we're going to look at uh, the libraries, the modules, and the tools um, that are used. Now, um, at this point, I just want to make everybody aware that there is a content warning on this talk. Um, digital forensics is often used um, to uh, do discovery in crimes and some kind of nasty things. Um, and while we're not going to go a lot into that, it is going to be touched on. So I just want to make everybody aware. Um, if you feel uncomfortable at any point, go ahead and leave. I'm not going to be upset. Clicker went the wrong way. So about me, uh, I just moved over from Scotland. Um, my degree um, field was digital security, forensics, and ethical hacking. So I do a little bit of all of this. Um, digital security is kind of about the processes and policies behind, um, behind security. Um, ethical hacking is more kind of the penetration side of things. Um, the penetration testing side of things, I should say. Um, and we're going to look at forensics just now. So what is forensics, digital forensics? Sadly, digital forensics is not all sunglasses, Humvees, and really bad puns, although I kind of wish it was, um, unfortunately. Um, forensics is the application just, just straight normal forensic science is the application of science to, um, to law and to, to solving questions posed by law. So digital forensics is this really interesting spot where science and technology and law all intersect. And um, it's the application, I'm just going to put this as, as I would put it, it's the application of the scientific process to the investigation of div digital evidence. Now, um, that's not a technical definition. That's just how I look at it. Um, Ken Zatko defined it in 2007 as, and I'm going to read this off because it's a little complicated. The application of computer science and investigative pro procedures for a legal purpose involving the analysis of digital evidence, which encompasses proper search authority, chain of custody, validation with mathematics, use of validation tools, repeatability, and possible expert presentation, which is a lot. There's a lot there. Um, I think one of the important things to remember is that digital forensics is not just about your laptop or what's on your desktop, but it also encompasses mobile devices, um, networks, the cloud, and increasingly the internet of things. Um, so digital forensics um, is used extensively in the investigation of child abuse cases. Um, however, and, and I would say that historically that's been kind of its first application and arguably is still one of its largest applications. Um, however, increasingly it's being used in, in criminal investigations, civil litigation, intelligence gathering, and corporate, corporate administration. So we're going to look at a couple of those just to kind of get a better idea of what digital forensics is. So digital forensics is used um, increasingly in criminal investigations, um, such as in the case of the serial killer, it was used to actually provide evidence which caught the killer 30 year plus after he actually did his crimes, which is excellent. Um, so in courts, when we talk about computer forensics, we're talking about the actual investigation. Um, however, when you get to court, 
they term digital forensics as e-discovery. And e-discovery is being used more and more, um, especially in civil litigation cases. Um, there's not, because it's still quite new, there's not a whole lot of data, um, but we are seeing its requirement um, going up. The amount of cases that are using it and the amount that is being spent on it is going up. And this is a projection um, of how they're expecting that to, to increase over the next few years. So in intelligence gathering, digital forensics is being used a lot. Um, I don't know if you will remember earlier this year, um, there was a, a court case where the FBI wanted to sue Apple to get them to unlock a mobile device that was used by the San Bernardino um, shooters. Um, and that court, that, that court case had a lot of implications and actually was very carefully chosen. Um, the FBI had asked this of Apple on several occasions beforehand, um, but this was the case that they chose to bring to court. Um, and it caused a lot of controversy. And it was actually not settled in court. They withdrew the, they, they withdrew the case and ended up paying over $1.34 million to a company to have the phone uh, un unlocked, rather than continue trialing the case because um, they were concerned that it was not going to go the way that they wanted it to. Now, with corporate investigations, there's kind of two sides of things. Um, there is the side where um, the corporate administration pays attention to what the employees of the company are doing, what they're using their computers for. Um, and it was actually found that um, in 2008, when the last crash happened on Wall Street, um, that, the CE, that the SEC employees who should have been paying attention who should have been watching for this were actually busy looking at other things on the internet. Um, 31 serious offenders um, were caught um, in a two and a half year period. Um, in this particular instance, um, 17 of these were senior officers who had six figure salaries and none of them were fired. Um, yeah. The other side of corporate investigation um, is when computer forensics is used to look at how hackers attempted to get into a business. And in July, there were a lot of cases like this. So um, forensics kind of looks at how they got in, what they were doing while they were there, what they were touching, um, and what potentially they took out with them. So that's like when, um, like when PlayStation got hacked, their team of investigators would have followed the traces back to find out how that was done and secure the, the system against that happening again. Um, they are the proverbial, proverbial inspector gadgets to the hacker's Dr. Claw. So, what does digital forensics actually look like? What are the tasks that are carried out by forensics investigators to do all this discovery and to gather all this information? The really, the kind of the reality is that there are a lot of, of smaller tasks that are used, carried out to build up um, this source of information. And we're gonna look at these tasks through the tools in which are used to carry them out. Um, these tools are, are, they're all Python tools. Um, there are, Python isn't the only language used in digital forensics, so you'll notice that there are more tools for some actions than for others. Um, that's just because this is where the focus is for tools that are using the Python language. Sorry, I'm a, a little nervous, so you'll have to forgive me. <laughs> so, um... <laughs> The, uh, the first um, task that is carried out, um, or that we're going to look at at least, is the extraction of metadata. 
So metadata is data that is associated with a file that isn't the, the, the file itself. So if you think in the terms of pictures, it's the information like where it was taken, um, what time it was taken, what day it was taken. It's this kind of associated information with the file itself. So um, the first tool that we're gonna look at um, is Python image library. Um, and it's actually part of the default Python um, download. You don't need to have anything, like any additional libraries or modules um, downloaded to use it. Um, this is a really surprisingly powerful tool. Um, I've seen it used to extract, extract met metadata and um, by extracting the uh, latitude and longitude and the date and time for a set of pictures, um, that information can then be used to track where and when um, the pictures were taken on Google Maps um, so that you can determine where the person that took them was and how long it took them to get from point A to point B, which um, can be really important. I, I know that this was used in the case of a, um, a death in the UK about four years ago. Um, that was really vital information to finding a killer. Um, we then have PyDF, which is, again, really interesting. Um, it extracts metadata from, you may not be surprised by this, but from uh, PDF files. Um, PDF files can have objects inside them, um, like pictures. Um, so this can be used to look at what PDF files may have been tampered with on a system or what files contain pictures which may need to be analyzed um, as part of an investigation. And OLE file um, is, again, a metadata extraction tool for um, Microsoft Office files. Microsoft Office files, like your saves for Microsoft Word or Excel, they're actually not one file. They're kind of a, a catch-all picture for a grouping of files. Um, and they can contain a lot of information, not just date, time, who created the file, um, where it came from, or, or when it was last saved, but they actually um, often will contain um, revisions. So if you go in and you delete a file or you, or you delete information in a Word file um, and save, that information isn't necessarily deleted. Using forensics, we can actually roll that back and find out what information you deleted um, from the file. Um, the, the next set of tools we're gonna look at, and there, there are a lot of tools here, so we're not actually gonna get a chance to, to look at any of these in depth. Um, I apologize for that. Um, but these tools are used for um, decryption and of ciphers. Um, so Python string library, it, it kind of comes standard. Um, it's, it's really interesting. It has this um, function in it called make trans. And what you can actually use this to do is to um, take a string of letters and change them to another string of letters. So let's say you have ABC. You can use this function to take ABC and translate every A into a D, every B into an E, and every C into an F. So you can use it for basic um, conversion, um, which is really useful. You can build these up and and use them for deconversion. So if you're if you're finding a if you've got a string of letters, you can use this to very rapidly try and figure out what that actually meant. Um, I feel like I didn't explain that well. <laughs> um, so the PyCrypto um, provides search hash functions and um, for various um, encryption algorithms, it's quite good. Um, Cisco is a company that makes networking equipment. Um, and for a very long time, they used a very um, insecure um, cipher for their passwords on their devices. And Lib Cisco Crack can actually go into that old, um, if the 
device is still on one of the old operating systems. Confusingly enough, Cisco called their operating system iOS, um, as well as Apple. Um, but if it's one of the older versions of iOS, then you can use this to actually crack the passwords really, really quickly. Um, Base64 can be used um, to convert, funnily enough, Base64 um, encoding to plain text. Um, this can be used to create a DES brute force password cracker in about 20 lines of code. Zip file um, can be used to crack passwords on zipped um, documents because passwords in zip documents are generally not very good. Um, next set of tools we're gonna look at are for primarily email and browser um, forensics, but the second one has kind of some wider applications. Poplib um, is really great. It can provide you with a set of tools to um, connect to an email account via the pop um, word has gone out of my head <laughs> um, via pop and um, actually download all associated um, emails and then go through them with a keyword search to look for information. And then PE file um, is an interesting tool. Um, it was, I think, primarily used for um, malware. And what it's used for is to find files that are associated with other files. So let's say that you open an email that you shouldn't have opened and um, you pick up some malware from it. You can delete that original file, the malware file, but the malware file might have um, installed other files on your system. And so you would use PE file to find those associations with other files that may not be in the same directory. They can be spread out all over the computer. So, I don't know how many people are on Windows machines. This may not be so relevant, but um, these tools are for Windows artifacts. Um, Veneto is um, a really interesting tool that's used to um, examine thumbnail um, files. So you can delete, like, so in Windows, you can delete a picture or, or a folder of pictures but if you have your, your system set up to display the little thumbnails of your pictures, those thumbnails never go away. Not unless you go looking for them and delete them manually. Um, and so Veneto allows us to go into a system um, where somebody has potentially deleted um, images and go and, go and find the evidence of, of what those images might have contained. Um, Pi UTMP is a tool actually for Unix systems. Um, and it's used to gain information about the users that are currently logged into a machine. Um, this is really great if you have a system that doesn't have GUI um, and perhaps somebody is trying to hide their tracks. Um, it's, it's difficult because if they're no longer logged in the machine, they're, they're a little harder to find, but this is good for um, for looking at what's currently active. Um, and then Analyze MFT is an interesting tool. Um, so Windows uses the NTFS file system. And as part of that, you have what's the, the MFT, which is the master file, file table. And this contains information. It's, it's essentially a database that contains information about every file um, and directory on the system. Um, and so you can use this to go back um, if somebody's tried to, so when you delete, sorry, I'm having to kind of go back up a little bit here. When you delete something off um, a Windows machine, um, if you put something into the recycle bin and you hit delete, it doesn't actually delete the file. What it does is it deletes the entry um, on the system to tell where that file is. And so through using this, you can then go back and try and reconstruct some of that information and find out where those files are. Um, and once you know where those files are, you can go in and, and carve that data back out um, of the system to find out what was deleted. 
Network forensics is a very big world. Um, SCAPI is used to do tasks like um, trace route, so that's looking at how you get, not just how you get from your computer to a server, but exactly what stops your packet is making along the way. Um, it's also used for probing for unit tests um, and for network discovery, so you can discover what might be attached to your network um, or to your system. Yeah, um, it can also kind of, uh, as kind of on a smaller level, it can forge or decode packets of data, um, capture them in transit as well. So we have um, hard drive forensics. It's kind of when I was talking about being able to find um, where on a hard drive um, something is and then carving that data back out. Um, that, that's hard drive forensics. And I've not, I've not used PyFlag. Um, I tend to use um, SleuthKit. Um, but PyFlag is a very similar tool in used, using Python, implemented in Python, um, that actually provides a GUI um, for this type of work. I'm used to using more command line based stuff. Um, and this lists allocated and unallocated files and then sorts the files by type um, and allows you to do keyword searches through the files that um, may or may not, that, that may have been, so, sorry. Uh, an unallocated file is a file that is in theory deleted. Um, and so you can do keyword searches on files that have been deleted. Um, so volatile memory forensics is forensics that's carried out on, rather than hard drives, which are a type of long-lasting memory, um, it's actually on, on the memory that you're using to, um, to run processes on your machine. And so there's a lot of things that you can catch in your volatile memory that you wouldn't be able to catch otherwise, just passwords being passed from the keyboard to a program. Um, you can catch a lot of things in transit rather than resting. Um, so this is a really important part of forensics. And it's a whole, a whole big world. Um, volatility is this massive framework um, for memory forensics. Um, it was first brought out in 2007, um, and it's now on release 2.5. Um, it's one of the largest open source projects for digital forensics. Um, and the uh, foundation, Volatility Foundation, that supports it is now an independent um, 5013 nonprofit organization, which is brilliant um, to, to have it in the hands of, of the group and the community that work on it. Um, it's supported on Windows, Mac, and Linux, um, and it provides tools for the analysis of RAM um, from, this is a lot, uh, for 32 and 64 bit windows for Linux, for Mac, and Android systems. So it pretty much covers um, most systems that you could imagine wanting to, to do this on. Um, even, even the Internet of Things devices that are very, very small tend to run on um, some type of, some flavor of these things. So um, it's really interesting to find what information you can find it's a terrible sentence. Um, so the, the, as I said, the, the framework is absolutely massive and it, it has a lot of tools on it. Um, it probably deserves a talk of its own. Um, but it does have some really interesting tools. Um, it has um, a tool that can read the keyboard buffer that's used um, by your BIOS. Um, so when you type, that goes into your BIOS and then it feeds back into the operating system so it can read that buffer. Um, you can catch, um, you can use a tool called Connections, which does a print list of all open connections on your system. Uh, you can do a, um, uh, you can dump uh, DLL files from processes that are currently running. Um, you can, there's a tool to extract Windows event logs um, from volatile memory. 
Um, some of these tools are really, really neat, uh, but you need to have a, a better understanding of, of what actually goes into digital forensics to really understand their worth. Um, Git sets is a great functionality within volatility, which allows you to, um, to look at which SIDs own the processes that are running. Um, and this can be really important to determine um, what the source of a, um, a process is. Um, there are certain processes that, uh, certain malware that will um, run a process and give it a legitimate name um, that mirrors a, a process that would be running on your system anyway to make it look benign. Um, but it will, will be running from the wrong user. So there are certain file or certain processes that should only be run by your system. Um, so when you're looking at malware, um, you can be like, okay, so process ABCD um, is not running from system, it's running from user James. That's not correct, that's probably malware. Um, it's really good to, to discover that kind of information. Um, and then there is a functionality within this called memdump, which you can use to actually dump the entire contents of the volatile memory for further um, investigation. So it's a really, really great tool um, that I'm still trying to know better. Um, so. That's pretty much my talk. Um, I just want to thank all of you for being such great, such a great audience and listening so quietly. Um, and I want to thank um, PyDX for, for having me to, to talk to you about this subject. It's a fascinating subject. Um, there's so, so much that goes into it. Um, and it's a really huge rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> you could start on one thing and just end up going into all sorts of things. So um, if you're interested in it, I'm happy to talk more about it um, outside. Um, so I think the only thing left is questions. Um, you can either write them down or I'm quite happy for people to raise their hands or a mixture of both or whatever you're comfortable with, I'm comfortable with. So thank you. <laughs>